23 and a half point underdogs. Is there a path to victory for Michigan State? Well, you're going to have to squint, but there might be a way this road is paved. Let's go. You are Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Spartans is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners, thank you all so much for tuning in to Locked on Spartans, your team in green and white five days a week, right here in the Locked on Podcast Network. Please rate, review, subscribe, reach out to us, LockedOnSpartans at gmail.com. And just want to thank everyone for getting ready for a fifth game this year for our Michigan State Spartans, but it's not just going to be me babbling on and on. It's actually not going to be just football. We will get into basketball recruiting here at the very end with the one, the only Justin Thind of 24-7 Sports. And Justin, I I don't, I don't want to like throw you on the spot here. I don't want to you know share private conversations, but right before we started recording, you looked dead into your webcam, lean in the microphone, and you said, Matt, Michigan State's doing it. They are beating Ohio State outright on Saturday. Care to elaborate on that? I didn't just put words in your mouth, right? That, that is what you said. I heard you correctly. Yeah. Uh, soccer team is good. I think uh, they can pull it <laughs> off. Um, not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> That's good. There we go. So, no, guys, look, it's a 23-and-a-half point uh, spread coming up. Michigan State is, you know – more than likely going to lose this game. I'm not feeling too high about it. And you know what? We're going to start right there, actually, because when the world zigs, uh, we zag. And yesterday, we talked with Jay Stevens of Locked on Buckeyes. All right, we talked a lot about Ohio State. They're an incredible team. But we're going to set this conversation up with a tweet from Matt C. He's a listener of this show. He's actually probably who I have the most toxic relationship with out of anyone in my life. One week, we will both love each other. The other week, oh, God, I swear we are going to meet somewhere in Howell, Michigan, and just duke it out. But he writes in about yesterday's show. Most depressing episode of Lockdown the Spartans ever, dude. I don't need 30 minutes of you fawning over OSU. Act like a man. Give me a pathway to keep it close. Childs magically plays a clean game. The defense steps up in challenges come on he said now first i want to defend myself it's not like we talked to locked on ruckers or locked on iowa some you know decent at best team like no ohio state has how many pros on their team like this is a wagon of a team coming in the reason we didn't talk bad about osu so guys where are the where is the weakness with this team but let's talk about this path to victory jt it does start with magic uh, a magically clean game from aiden childs Okay. Also, Kenneth Walker coming back. I also wake up tomorrow morning six foot five with ten more million dollars in my bank account, and I'm a member of Augusta National Golf Course. But look, I think the Aiden Child's clean game. That's all in the fantasy world. The real world here, though, JT, that defense has been cooking for Michigan State so far this year. If MSU were to win, they would have to overcome Ohio State and their pass protection. Ohio State has just allowed 11 pressures this entire season on Will Howard. That's insane. That ranks 158th per pro football focus out of all FBS teams. There's 130-some FBS teams. There are backups for other teams that have been pressured more than Will Howard so far this year. But MSU, they lead the Big Ten with 15 sacks, 32 tackles for loss. Also, Ohio State's second-best run offense in the country, 7.1 yards per carry. Now, MSU, they've shown they can stop the run. 3.1 yards per carry allowed. That is 19th best in the country. So, JT, if there's a path to victory, it's obvious. It all has to start in that defense, right? Because the offense, well, they're going to be handicapped a little bit. Ta take it away. Where do you see the path to keeping it a close, if not a victory, here on this blessed Saturday coming up? So, the thing that I, that right away that jumps to my mind is how is this MSU team different than the last few that hasn't even been able to stay on the field with Ohio State? Brilliant question. Yeah. The, the first thing that comes to my mind is the last couple offenses, there was no hope. Like, there was absolutely no hope. Yep. This offense at times, um, you're handing the ball to the other team with 17 yards to go uh, from their end zone to score in two plays. Other times, they are marching this ball down the field in sustained 10-play drives. Sometimes they'll just throw a 70-yard bound to Nick Marsh, and they'll get points that way. The defense, I think, has a much higher floor in this matchup than they've had in the past. I think there's a greater degree of competency. I think they're good at stopping the run. 
Mm -hmm. um, I know they're playing against Quinshawn Judkins and Trayvon Henderson, but I don't expect there to be like 375 yard touchdown runs in one play or anything like that. Sure. And um, Jeremiah Smith is the absolute real deal, but Marvin Harrison was a more of a real deal, at least when he was playing as a junior. Um, so I don't think Ohio State's going to be going ahead and scoring on every single drive in five or six plays. What I remember from the past few games, maybe this is selective memory, but the offense would protect the ball. Now, in three plays before a punt, it's not that many plays where you have a chance of turning it over because you're running yeah, right. you know, <laughs> in the stands on third and eight and punting it. Yes. But I think this time around, uh, there's going to be more interceptions. Uh, there's going to be more volatility, but I think they're going to be sustaining more drives, and I think they're going to be able to score more points than they ever have before. And um, I think you're going to be offset by some of the uh, yardage that the defense is going to have to defend this time, meaning like they're going to have shorter fields. They're going to have to defend them in years past. But I yep. think last year's Ohio State and the year before, they would be able to march down the field quicker. So I think that's the trade-off. Like, sure, this time around, Charles is probably going to have the defense in a bad spot a few times. But it doesn't really matter. Like last year, Ohio State would go 75 yards in like six plays. So this year, if they go 41 yards in four plays, like that to me doesn't really change anything. But the potential on offense is higher to score more points than before. And let's just keep it to the offense right now because, you know, Aiden Childs, he will get help because, well, reported by Pete Thamel and then also confirmed by you. John Glover, he will be back for this game Saturday. Nick Marsh, I I've heard – cautiously optimistic but uh, you know certainly i'm certainly not reporting that he is going to play you know the, the person i talked to said looking okay still too early to tell so that that's where i'm at right now i don't know if you have any other information that you're willing to share right now but at the very least drunk glover seems that yeah. he will be back. so that's only gonna help but i mean yeah. any marsh well, nuggets or no yeah it seems like with marsh the only thing isn't like what kind of pain or like how limited he is but mm -hmm. there's also worry about like re-aggravation yeah. Um, so that's the other side of it. So um, there was optimism last week when he missed the Maryland game that he would definitely be back for the Ohio State game. Um, they were like pretty sure about that being the case. But right now, um, I wouldn't say it's as sure as it was at the time just because of the re-aggravation risk. But we'll see. I, neither outcome would surprise me. Yeah. Um, the way I see it is like you obviously can't have a defeatist attitude. You can't be like, oh, well, you're not going to beat Ohio State, so just rest them anyway. Because by that logic, you can say, oh, rest them against Oregon, and then you have a bye. And then, so, like, that that never ends. But, like, I would say if there's a greater chance of re-aggravation, and it's not just him maybe being at 70% for this game in a vacuum, I wouldn't play him. Um, but I guess we'll see what the doctors and, and those guys decide. Now, cowards like me can say that because that's what I said <laughs> after the game. I was like, you sit him for Ohio State, you sit him for Oregon. Because, look, I, call me the chicken little of the fan base. Uh, I, I think I have reason at this point to be worried about season-ending injuries. Should anything be re-aggravated re right. just based on what we've seen the first few weeks as a Michigan State fan? But, again, I'm just a coward with a webcam and a microphone. I'm sure the staff thinks largely different about this game. So, hey, you know what? We'll, we'll see. Again, we're probably not going to know until a few hours before kickoff. If that's so, that's just your Nick Marsh news right there. Uh, yeah. We'll see. As of now, still not season ending, which is nice. Uh, just to, you know, keep it on the, the pass game right now. Mm -hmm. In reality, I you know what, of course, you know, Childs having a clean game is going to be a key here. I think that's because, well, he's going to have to throw Michigan State to a victory. Ohio State's run defense, I believe, given up just 1.8 yards per carry. And I get it. They played Akron. They played Western Michigan. They played Marshall. Like, they're not playing world beaters necessarily to start the season. That's still really good after yeah. your first three games of the year. MSU's run offense, everyone knows my opinion on it. It's certainly not world baiting. So I think Aiden Childs will have to throw Michigan State to a victory here. Yes. How many turnovers do you allow him before you just write off a victory? For me, you get one interception. And if you do any more than that, then I, I oh boy, you're asking a lot from the defense on the other side yeah. there. I, I think the way I put it is it has to be a positive differential like between his touchdowns to interceptions. Now, if he throws two INTs, but in some world he has four passing touchdowns by all means. Okay. But if if you're looking at one touchdown, three interceptions, I, I don't think there's any any shot that they possibly even cover the spread, let alone um, if them winning a the game. But uh, certainly, in in a gunslinger's world, like where they where they make throws that you're like, what are you doing, dude? Like they don't make those in high school. And then there's other throws where you're like, wow, there's like nobody making that throw at this level. You only win out if there's many more of the good plays than the bad ones. So that's just how I put it. I, I never expect him to weed out the bad plays. I mean, maybe by the time he's a senior. Or, 
maybe if he's sure. in the NFL, like by year four, like it takes guys forever to, to reprogram their minds and what their arms able to do. But you just have to keep winning the battle between the wild plays and, and the head scratching plays. We're going to talk about, you know, things that we just want to see on top of a Michigan State victory. You know, th- that'd be delightful. It would just be the most oh God, out of control post game show that we've done here in Lockdown Spartans, probably since the 2021 win against Michigan. But uh, hey, let's hope we have that problem here. But guys, first, need to talk all your ears off about Robin Hood. That is right, new friend of the program. With Robin Hood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robin Hood Gold allows others to get the rates and perks usually reserved for the high society. Now, the resourceful individual with Robin Hood Gold can earn the very liberal rate of 4.5 APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with the handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of a high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for only five dollars a month. The new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. Terms apply for product uh, specific disclosures. Visit Robinhood.com slash gold. Investing involves risk. Rate may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold LLC. Also gang, you already know it. It's game day episode. I'm rocking my home field. I got my hat on too. Home field hat, home field shirt. Why? Because both look sensational. Love the vintage logos you can find at homefieldapparel.com. And also, not just for Michigan State too. Bebop around. See what other schools are out there. They just dropped a sick Howard lineup this week, actually, over at Home Field Apparel. So go on over. It's like looking at a museum. But, hey, out of it, you get some incredible clothing that will be the most comfortable articles of clothing you will have in your closet. Whether it's T-shirts, crew neck sweatshirt, hoodies, lawn sleeve T-shirts, or even this hat that I got right now. Yes, you will be looking great and feeling even better in home field apparels, clothing. And, guys, hey, they still got some platinum boxes laying around. With that, you get an exclusive hoodie, exclusive T-shirt, exclusive lawn sleeve shirt. All you got to do is plug in your sizes and... Hey, when you do it at homefieldapparel.com, save yourself some money with promo code SPARTAN24. That's all one word, SPARTAN and the number 24. That's going to save you 15% off on your first purchase. Again, guys, SPARTAN24 at homefieldapparel.com. Now, let's drag him back out here. His name is Justin Thin, does fantastic work over at 24-7 Sports. And you know what? Outside of a win, what do we want to see in this game? And I know this sounds repetitive for me at least, but... I, I, I want to see this run defense. Obviously, the best test they will have the rest of the year. This is two running backs that will be playing on Sundays in the very near future, running behind an offensive line that I'm going to go out on a limb and guess we'll also have NFL players one day. It will not get tougher. This run defense has been a shining star so far. If you get out of here, and I'm not saying, you know, hold Ohio State to 2.7 yards per carry, like, if they can hold them in like even the mid four point something yards, limit the explosive plays. Well, these Iowa games, the Michigan games, mm-hmm. all these games against run heavy teams. I, I mean, wow. I, that'd be really hard to not just have Michigan state as a live dog in those games, just on run defense alone. So that's the number one thing I want to see. This is your capstone 400 level course for the defense. How are you going to look? Because if you look good, Oh, <laughs> Catch us after the bye week feeling saucy about ourselves. Yeah, I I would definitely agree. Like you are looking at if if you can have like a C plus performance against this offensive run game, if you're suddenly projecting the Iowa game where Caleb Johnson is their entire team, yep, uh, that is looking much better. Um, obviously, we saw Michigan, even though they beat USC, um, they had one first down uh, in the entire second half until yep. that Mullings run. Uh, they're just they they won that game off of what they did in the first half. And even that was like a lot of just Miller Moss not being able to like really do anything. But you're looking at those two games suddenly look in a completely different light. Because right now, like, yes, the run defense looks good. But we don't know over a large sample size. Like Robichaud at Boston College is like pretty good. But like their offensive line isn't a bunch of maulers. Like, yeah, they're like Nola solid. Hemby's good. Right. But like their run game as a whole, like the scheme and the, the whole line's like not very good. And yeah. You're, but but the thing is, like, it means something right now to Michigan State fans where the run defense is and what the defense as a whole is because what we've seen the last four years is there have been teams worse than Boston College and Maryland that have made this defense look average yeah. to, to bad. So we can't take away from what they've done so far, but there's a lot that we don't know. And I can talk a lot about the pass rush and those 15 sacks and why I'm not necessarily jumping over the moon at those stats either. 
But like, if you can hold the run game to like an average level, I think it's a huge win. No doubt about it. And you know what? We're going to go swimming in the mailbag here in a hot second. But first, you know what? We actually do have to shout out women's soccer for Michigan State. And sorry to like kind of shoehorn this in the middle of a show here, but I, wow. Uh, number one in the United Soccer Coaches Poll for the first time ever. They were 8 0 oh, 2 entering the week. They are now 8 0 oh, 3 on Thursday. They played number 11 Ohio State on the road. Back and forth game. They tied them 2 to 2. They will be home. Versus Rutgers this Sunday at noon. So just had to shout out the women's soccer team over there. Number one for the first time in program history. So as we kick it back to football here, Luke writes in, let, let's, let's just stay in this world for just mm -hmm. a little longer, JT, or Michigan State. You know what? They do the same thing that the Spartans did 50 years ago at Spartan Stadium. They stun Ohio State as almost four touchdown underdogs. If MSU pulls off the upset Saturday, what would your expectations for the rest of the season be? That's loaded. I oh man, that's a tough. That's actually a tough question. I think so. Do you have an instant answer for that one? If not, I could walk first. Um, I would say that they, at the very least, would then have to compete the following week against Oregon, even if they don't win it. Um, I, I can't say they need to go eleven and one, uh, mm -hmm. but they need to compete in that game at Oregon, and then they would have to beat Michigan. They would have to beat Iowa, and then if they don't get absolutely battered by. Um, injuries in the, sure. in the ensuing in, in those four games that we talked to talked about just taking place they've got to go like three and one like through the rest of the stretch and maybe one of those games Charles throws like four interceptions and K. Ron Lynch Adams twists his ankle in the second quarter like some fluke stuff happens on the road yeah. like, against the mid team but like you'd have to compete in the next game you'd have to to beat Michigan and you'd have to have a mostly non-volatile season the rest of the way with the forgiveness of maybe one game I, I think even with the win here, you know, you're looking at something like you know, Rayleigh Quest Bowl, which I know sounds like a bowl game that a bunch of five and seven teams get into and they just make it on APR score, but that's what used to be the Outback Bowl, if I'm not mistaken. That's yeah, actually yeah, a pretty that's solid a bowl. bowl game. Or like Nine the Citrus three. Bowl. Yeah. yeah, just like, you know, I, I, it sounds ridiculous because you'd be four and one with like the best win in college football <laughs> at, at that point, but I, college football playoff, of course we would talk about it. Of course we would dream about it. I just think, wow, with Oregon, Six days later on the west side of this country, I that'd be yeah. a little tough. Yeah. Even after your bye, like I, I know I feel good about the Iowa game. Certainly not a guarantee. The Michigan game, yeah. far from a guarantee. Of course, I still don't think they'll win that game. But look, ten and two is the record you have to have to make the college football playoff. Can you skate the rest of the year without dropping one game? I, I don't know, but still, you can make a top play bowl game. Yeah, they're they're too thin. Like, there's going to be losses that you don't like. Correct. Like the Boston College one, like they didn't lose that because of injuries. But that's a like the receivers played well. Like if they had enough yards, even though the receivers yeah. are out. But like that's one of those games where you're like, all right, a night game at Boston College. This the program is not at a spot yet, but they're winning every game where they are on the same tier as the other program. So I I mean like I don't see them beating Ohio State really at all tomorrow. Yeah. Um, or sorry, Saturday, but like, yeah, if, if that were to happen, I think it doesn't speed up the rebuild, but it speeds up the amount of uh, games that they should be able to yeah. win and the lack of volatility that should ensue. And like, you know what? It, it also lets everyone know out there in Spartan Nation, a lot of people are saying this, that MSU is just a competent coach away mm -hmm. from being okay. Like you, you, you would need a competent with a capital C on this yeah. one should they beat Ohio State amongst many other things going in the right mm -hmm. way. But I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at right now. This kind of funnels into Gregory's question pretty good here because this is, a, you know, again, a broad overview here. What would be considered a win on the season, whether that be a specific game win or record of some sort or even a moral victory? God, there's so many options here because, yeah, you know what? Eight and four looks pretty good. Six and six does, especially, you know, if a win against Michigan is in the mix yeah. here. But for me, I, I'm KISS, keep it simple, Spartans. I make, make a bowl game. Yeah. Uh, you know, yep. get those extra three weeks of bowl practices and it's a win. I don't, I don't care how they get it, I don't care what happens. Um, get those extra bowl practices, especially with the young roster, and especially with being a developmental staff, and that's literally all that matters. Five and seven with the win against Michigan, or six and six, no wins against Michigan, Oregon, Ohio State. You know, it's just what 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 are you taking right now if you're a Michigan State fan? Um, it depends how much they think they could use that win against Michigan in recruiting yeah. battles, and how much that would accelerate future program right. Building. If, if if you're like, all right, one win against Michigan in a year where they probably aren't making uh, a great bowl, like right now they're probably a reliant quest bowl team, if not worse. Um, mm -hmm. 
I don't know how much that does help recruiting. So maybe the, the, the six and six. Um, but like, yeah, that's probably what I would lean towards. Uh, I, I, at the end of the day, like trading three weeks of developmental bowl practices just for a win against Michigan sounds like that little brother thing that they try to claim is like a, a big thing. Uh, but like, I, I think the three practices would do so much more for the program as a whole than, than one win against a rough to bad Michigan team. I also just need new bowl game shirts in, in my closet over here, JT. Like <laughs> no. it's, it's been a few years. So no, look, I'm going to go with the six at, and six. I will see you at Puckett's in Nashville, Matt. Music City. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Perhaps a Jacksonville bowl game, the tax layer, but let's lay some taxes down there, JT. Um, <laughs> look, if I had to pick, I would go six and six too. Um, yeah. If that makes me a bad spar, then so be it. Now that's not to say <laughs> if we went five and seven with the win against Michigan, that you wouldn't be hearing about it from me during the whole off season. I mean, oh, you didn't even make a bowl game, Sparty. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, and you still lost to us. Oh, yeah. we got the comebacks already lined up over oh, here, yeah. but it's it's picking between two decent options right there. But, yeah, yeah I, the, the bowl game, I think that is your success for the season. I, I know it's a, a short, simple answer, but that's what I got for you right here. JT, we're going to mix it up here. We're going to talk about basketball recruiting because there's been some news, and you know, I'm little Mr. Johnny Rancloud over here about basketball recruiting. Maybe you will set me straight here. But first, need to talk to people's ears off about Fan Duel Sportsbook. Guys, you've heard me say about 48,000 times this week, Michigan State, you know, 24 and a half point underdog, 24. Well, right now it's at 23 and a half points right over there at FanDuel. Guys, they just don't have lines. They don't have just over-unders, which by the way, 48 and a half is the over-under. They also got your props, your same game parlays. And there's one prop that I actually don't hate for Michigan State. I know that I'm not high in the Michigan State run game. But right now, Karon Lynch Adams, 36 and a half rushing yards is his over under. I think he's going to be, you know, the guy getting most shares here. They're not going to not run the ball ever. Can he just climb his way to 40 yards in the angry way that he runs? Perhaps that's where my money is going to be going this weekend. But guys, you know what? It's just more than college football over at FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That is all at FanDuel.com. Again, guys, America's number one sports book $200 in bonus bets guaranteed on your first $5 bet. Just head over to FanDuel.com. All right, we are dragging it back for one more segment. It is Justin Thin of 24-7 Sports. And, hey, basketball recruiting, uh, like, it's it's buzzing lately, but it kind of has been buzzing all offseason because our guy Tom Izzo, he cast a very wide net for this 2025 class. Jalen Harrelson, he picks Notre Dame. Okay, and then Trey McKinney today, he leaves Michigan State off his top three. That's a borderline five-star kid, homegrown from the state of Michigan. Not having the Spartans in his top three, that hurts. Braylon Mullins, another highly ranked guy. He's out of the mix for Michigan State. Darius Adams, a lot of smoke blowing to UConn. Dwayne Aristod, you know what? Maybe he's on Michigan State's board still, but Duke is heavy after him. Gee, wonder how this story ends. Cam Ward, solid player still on the board for Michigan State. And Niku Bundalo as well. That's like, you know, UConn in the mix. I believe Kansas in the mix, too. I just – so, look, I waited all week to talk to you about this, JT, because I think I need to be set straight. I think a lot of people are going to love you even more after this chat because I just – my opinion right now is just not high on Michigan State basketball, the world of recruiting, because, look, the first few names I listed off, they're out of the mix. So you got your Dwayne Aristad. I, gee, what's going to happen? Or Duke or Michigan State? Oh, man. And then Bundala. I just like, do you, I, do you have any breath of fresh air to offer this program here and like actually make people smile listening to this? Or is it just going to be me just pooping on everyone's parade? Yeah, I think the, the, the way to, I guess, rationalize or, or feel better about the big picture is diving into every single recruitment that hasn't gone right and analyzing why. Yeah. Um, and none of those are the reason of Izzo being left behind, which is kind of the biggest fear of the fan base and which is well, sure. what yeah. I try to look for clues for almost every time that I look into the program because nobody wants that to happen. Um, so also like Aristide, I probably want to touch on him in, in the set in the segment much because really the only thing that I would say is I don't think Duke will have a spot for him uh, pretty soon. Uh, so I think it'll end up being Michigan State and maybe Arizona, even though the Arizona okay. writers themselves don't seem very confident in their chances, even though I know Tipton did kind of hint at them. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so like 
similar to what happened, I guess, in the Darius Adams one, we'll start with him. Like Michigan State was going to beat Tennessee for Darius Adams if UConn decided to fill up and not take him because they landed Braylon Mullins. But Mm -hmm. the thing is, is their chances of landing Braylon Mullins were much less than Duke's chances of landing the Boozer twins and some of the other wings that they're after. So that's why I think that one could play out different and Michigan State could have a five-star on their hands in that scenario. Um, and then just Jay, Jalen Harrelson, I know I wrote very in-depth on this kind of in the yep. recruiting notebook I posted today. This one, um, he basically made his decision in reverse NIL order. Uh, they were, I thought a couple of months ago, they were probably going to lose Harrelson to, Harrelson to Indiana and just because they didn't want to pay an obscene amount of money. That mm-hmm. ended up not being the case. He, he didn't care about the obscene amount of money. He wanted to be used like Jalen Pickett, who Michael Shrewsbury had at Penn State, and he would yep. have the ball in his hands the entire shot clock. Personally, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, Jalen Pickett had the ball in his hand so much because he wasn't supremely athletic. He wasn't a great shooter. He was more so just a physical presence that kind of would body his way to the rim. A lot so, of booty ball. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So I don't yep. necessarily know why Harrelson wants to be in that mold, but – People have made worse decisions before for worse reasons than mm-hmm. wanting to play for a coach that had a good track record as an assistant at Butler, at Purdue, good job sure. as a head coach at Penn State, time with Brad Stevens in the NBA. Like, it is what it is. And um, you didn't lose because Izzo was too cheap. And you didn't lose because um, of, of something that is of that nature where you're like, oh, man, he can't compete in the NIL era. So sure. that because that's what I look for almost every single time that there's a recruitment. Now, like Darius Adams. You're going to lose them to a program that has won back-to-back national titles. I guess the complaint could be, why are you going after a guy that maybe has the back-to-back defending national champions after him? But they weren't after him for the, for the most of his recruitment. Gotcha. And this is a guy you've been working on for over a year and a half. He's from the Midwest. The defending national champions come and, and get him. I, I guess so I, So be it. So That's like, the game. I know. Right. So, like, yeah. oh, and you stack these developments. You're like, oh, man, this sucks. Like, everyone's coming off the board. But, like, there's no one reason that's a recurring theme that you can point to and be like, man, he just can't get over the hump with this factor or or with this resistance or his hesitance sure. to do this or that. And then Trey McKinney, now they're not in the top three, um, but I'd say, like, up to maybe two or three weeks ago, they were the number one school in his recruitment. And um, they had worked for almost two years to win over all the members of his family Okay. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to that at first, but they worked kind of tirelessly to um, kind of build up that relationship. And uh, Trey himself was always very pro MSU. He's always been respectful of, of coaches and the staff and all that. And they were making a lot of progress in that regard to the point where um, I had heard, and I kind of kept this to myself, and now I'm glad I did, uh, but I had heard that pretty much like that was going to be somebody that I expected to be a part of the class at the beginning of this month. Well, now okay. he's not even they're not even they're not on, <laughs> i guess i don't want to say not on speaking terms but like there's not going to be any attempts to to get back in the picture there uh from either side and uh kind of the the progress they've been trying to make with winning over some key players in his recruitment um just it, it, it kind of just blew up so that's kind of the, the i'm not going to say like they cooled on him because they did it they wanted him yeah two, for three sure ago. like he was somebody that wanted in the class but like, let's just say that there's no um, regret uh, from the Michigan State side, and I guess it's better that things played out the way they did now than maybe after he possibly enrolled or something of that nature. Yeah. I'm just so, yeah, like, like it's just a lot of unfortunate development. I know. Like, I, like, what do you reasons. do? <laughs> I, I, I know, yeah. like, truly, what do you do? Like, that's that's right. a non rhetorical question or right. rhetorical. I, I get that screwed yeah, up all yeah, the time, yeah. but you know what I mean, like. If, so if Hurley takes the Lakers job, whether that was a legitimate offer or not, right. like, hey, you all were actually maybe smiling during this segment yes. uh, as it regards to Darius Adams. But I, so stay tuned. Any of those guys that we named like close to a decision that MSU even has like a tangibly slim shot of even picking up or is everyone kind of pushing it down more towards the I, line? I think I think Arist- Aristotle should probably be in the next two months. Um, OK, and then I think. I mean, Adams, like, well, I mean, somehow if they can swing Braylon Mullins back towards them instead of sure. Indiana's absurd amount of money that I, I don't right. even know what they're doing. But, like, <laughs> if, if they can bring Mullins back in the fold, maybe. Like, I know MSU is still fighting for Adams every single day. Um, and then, yeah, Aristo, like I said, like, Duke, Duke's going to know in the next couple weeks where they stand with some of okay. the, the Boozer twins and uh, some of the other wings that they're pursuing. So there's not going to be much reason for him to continue to push it after that. He just came, went on his USC visit. I think he has one more left, but 
Yeah, mm -hmm. like there shouldn't be too much longer before there's at least extensive clarity on the trajectory of this class. Um, a lot of people came off the board this week, uh, but I think if you can still somehow land Cam Ward and beat out Virginia, and I think Kansas State is surging there a little bit, but like the Maryland, the Maryland staff thinks that Michigan State's in the lead okay. for, for whatever it's worth. Um, so if you can land Cam Ward, who they've liked more than five-star Nico Bandalo for at least four months now. Wow. And okay. that he, he's been their like top of the top, cream of the crop, like target, regardless of position, probably with Harrelson and Aristo. So gotcha. you can two of your top three targets from like a positional positionless perspective are still on the board. And you need the Duke to land their double legacy or their legacy twins in the boozers to get one of them most likely, as long as the Arizona staff is has a good feel for the Arizona writers have a good feel for their chances of Aristo. And then if you just win the Cam Ward battle, you got two of your top three options still. And then you there get a Jordan go. Scott in the mix there, and you have a nice three-man class, or you just maybe use two spots for the portal instead of the one they're planning to pick. Bring the sunshine here. That's what I'm talking about. See, that, that's, that's why that's why we're really out of here, JT. That's what I'm talking <laughs> about, man. That's that's going to make people hopefully a little happier. Because, yeah, like, it's it's just those weird pockets of the news cycle where a lot of bad yeah. has happened in a very short right. amount of time, and now yes. – well, the sky's falling. Uh, not, not like we ever overreacted to that or anything on this show. Uh, all right, really quick before we get everyone out the door here, it is time for five best bets for this college football mm. weekend. We've been treading water all season, three and two, three and two, two and three. Last week, you already know it's three and two. That puts us at 11 and nine overall on the year. Look at JT. We are in the black, my man. Let's go. I think <laughs> last year we we I think last year we ended right at 500. So, uh, hey, treading water hey. is what we do here on this program. But uh, I'll rifle through all my picks really quick. Uh, for MSU versus Ohio State, I'm going to retract my prediction from yesterday's show. I said 41-17 when we recorded with Locked On Buckeyes. The more I think of it, the more, you know, the defenses are going to shine here, limit the explosive play. So I'm actually going to go under 48 and a half for my best bet for this Michigan State game. Under 48 and a half. Alabama plus two and a half against Georgia. Indiana minus seven against Maryland. I saw enough in the Maryland secondary a few weeks ago when they faced Michigan State. And I think Kurt Signetti is... Ho oh, hey, ho oh, oh. ho! Licking his chops to face the turtles. USC minus fourteen and a half in a get right game against a dead Wisconsin team, and then JT. I saved this one for the last one because I told you. I now I actually told you that I would not do this. I'm not making this up like the start of the show here. I'm doing it. I'm doing Penn State minus 17 and a half Ooh. against Illinois, against an Illinois team that has looked spectacular. 17 and a half points makes no sense. It is nonsense. But 88% of the public is betting the Illini. When people want to take the cheese, you let their heads get chopped off in the world of betting. You will be <laughs> on the 12% side. We're taking Penn State covering a massive number against a really solid Illinois team. So there's my five picks. JT, are you whipping up anything? Do you do you bet at all? By the way, I, just before I ask for any bets, do you do you do this at all or no? <laughs> yes, way too much. Uh, um, all right. <laughs> the so the funny thing is, like as Matt kind of referenced, like we talked about the Illinois thing, yeah. and um, I was this close to taking Illinois plus seventeen and a half yeah. as one of like the four or five um, like best bets that I put out in, in an article form every week. And then I was like, I, I got to be able to find something better than this. Like last oh. week, last <laughs> week by Tuesday, I had placed four bets and Wednesday I placed one and I had seven total bets, went five and two. Bad. This week, I have placed one bet so far and yeah. I'm going to have to grind and find some bets tonight for the article tomorrow yeah. morning. That like, I like every good gambler does. You got to grind yeah, and find exactly, them. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so what I really like, the, play, one, the bet that I placed on Tuesday was Nebraska minus nine and a half against Purdue. Okay. Like this line, I get like they're baking in like Dylan Riola, true freshman, away sure. game, conference game. But like Purdue is bad. Like Purdue is horrendous. Like it's, this it's horrible. Yeah. Them and like, I guess like Florida State before they won this past week. Uh, oh no, sorry, Mississippi State takes the cake for like the worst Power Four team that, that we've seen in certainly. In yeah. But like they're so bad, and I think like that's a game where like the line should be like 13, 13 and a half. I'd still take Nebraska. Um, okay. Like, if, watch them win by two, and I look stupid. But that one I loved. And then one of the other ones I loved was the Kansas State uh, Texas Tech games under fifty seven and a half. Okay, it opened at fifty four and a half. Uh, Avery Johnson could not throw the ball last week. Um, he's an electric runner, 
Um, mm-hmm. But for some reason, they don't want to run him too much. Like, I don't I don't get that. Like, I don't know if they're worried that he's going to get injured or, like, against Tulane and really the first three games of the season altogether, they had, like, nine rushing guards for the guy when he's yeah. a run-first quarterback. And I don't know what their apprehension is there, but, like, even if they do run him, it's going to shorten the game and it's going to, like, the ex- plays are not going to be as explosive. So, I, and Texas Tech is not that good. So yeah. that's another one that I like. And that there's another bet that I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for it to. Now I've already taken the alt line and and put more than a unit on it, but that's not how I like to give my bets to people. Sure. But I'm waiting yeah. for Miami minus 17 and a half to touch minus 17 against Virginia Tech, and that's okay. going in the article, and that's my lock of the week. If if that does touch that, and that's tomorrow night. Virginia Tech is just puzzling to me. I not not to go way over on time yeah. and make Mr. Lockdown <laughs> very upset, but. Uh, Virginia Tech goes like, oh, they return a lot from last year. Yeah, that's not good, though. (laughs) Well, what is that really returning then? And I say that as someone that I believe predicted Virginia Tech to make the college football playoff as one of the final 12 teams. And (laughs) watch the first game of the season, and that was a whoopsie, I realized. Uh, It's not a good team down there in Blacksburg. Uh, Anyway, folks, that is JT, Justin Thind of 24-7 Sports. Does fantastic work. Thrilled to be able to drag you back on, especially for a Friday pregame show here. Um, I think that was as jolly you know, as we could be ahead of an Ohio State game. Oh, yeah. I hope we made the Matt Seas of the world very happy. Um, but, hey, guys, you know what? No matter how it goes Saturday, win or lose, we will be back. Well, I will be. I, JT probably won't be. Um, I will be back at the very hey, least. Win. Why not? Everyone's invited if they win on Saturday. We're going to have 20 people. It's going to look like an election night <laughs> table of just people just barking at the same time. It's going to be just oh, sensational. Uh, but, hey, even if that doesn't happen, we'll be back again Saturday after Spartans, Buckeyes on Peacock. Catch the fever. All right, guys. Hey, take care of yourselves this weekend. If you tailgate, it's mixing the water. Love you all. Go Green.